Hello and welcome to Telecom TV. I'm talking with Martin Taylor, CTO of Metaswitch. Martin, I've never seen you before in my life. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> we have met so many times in so many different parts of the world. It's always good to see you. Thanks. I'd like to talk to you about Metaswitch and Metaswitch's position in the market and begin like this. As far as I'm led to understand that Metaswitch has the only complete voiceover LTE vault solution built from the ground up using cloud na native microservice methodologies and deployable within highly orchestrated lightweight container environments. Mm -hmm. Quite a mouthful. Yes, we indeed. will cover off what these words mean in order. Right, okay. sure, absolutely. Let's try it. Let's, let's go from here then. Cloud native, buzzword of the moment. Sure, absolutely. Okay, now, what is cloud native and why is, a, why is it so critical, do you think, to the future of communication service providers? Well, I mean, what it means at, at its heart is software that was designed and built to run in the cloud as its, as its home, as its native environment, right. uh, as distinct from software that started out life uh, either on a, on a physical appliance, you know, piece of proprietary hardware, or maybe just running, running bare metal on x86. And, and, and people say, well, so it's, it's all software, isn't it? So how is that different? Mm. Um, the, 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 there's a set of kind of architectural um, practices and, uh, and, and approaches to the way that the, the, the software is, is designed um, based on the idea that uh, in the cloud, you've got you know, elastic resources, you can deploy you know, any, any, any number of virtual machines you like according to the amount of capacity you've got uh, and, and grow and shrink capacity. That, that any of those virtual machines can just die at any time and your system is just going to carry on, on regardless. Um, and those kinds of approaches you know, are, are, very, are very different from running in a box that's you know, hardened and designed to be there all the time uh, and so on. Um, why is it important to, to, to network operators? Um, because this kind of software is far easier to deploy, makes more efficient use of hardware resources, um, it's more resilient in the face of, of, of various different kinds of failures. Um, I mean, essentially, if, if, if designed right and distributed across multiple locations, then no single fault of any kind at any layer in the stack, including the loss of an entire data center, will stop the service from, from, from running. Um, and the, the, the other thing about cloud native software is, that, I mean, this brings in the concept of microservices. Um, it's <laughs> The, the, the approach here is, is you take a big and complex problem and you decompose it into individual small building blocks, each of which has a very well-defined function and exposes that function through a well-defined API. Um, and if you, if you break your system up into a lot of small pieces like that, then you can individually evolve those components at their own pace and substitute different technologies as new technologies become available in a way that's just not possible with a big, chunky, monolithic, traditional uh, software design. So, you know, when, when we look at the web and you look at, uh, you know, pioneers in the web software space like Netflix, for example, you know, they've moved very strongly away from monolithic approaches to this microservices approach, and it's enabled them to be incredibly agile and, and innovate much more rapidly than they ever could before. And that's one of the things that telcos are looking for from NFV, right? Uh, you know, rapidity of, of innovation, uh, you know, embracing to, to, to the extent possible in the telco world, the DevOps idea, you know, where there's a constant stream of, of, of new releases coming, coming into the network, so the service is constantly evolving. That's possible with this microservices approach, you know, as, as part of the overall cloud native thing. Very cogent explanation. Thank, Good, thank you for you. that. That's helped me quite a lot personally, actually. Right. Here we go. Now, taking that, now then, NFV is what, four and a bit years old now, mm -hmm. four years and a, a bit since the first white paper. Um, how does cloud native philosophy differ from current NFV approaches and thinking? Um, well, what we see most of today is VNFs that started life on proprietary hardware platforms. Um, and it, that's no great surprise because uh, you know, a, a typical network function of the sort of level of complexity and sophistication that's deployed in today's networks you know, may take five or six years from start to get to the point of maturity where it's actually deployable. And many of these code bases, these you know, software uh, developments have been around maybe t you know, 10 or 15 years, some of them. Um, and you know, over time, they've grown warts. <laughs> and of course, they embody a lot of very old-fashioned practices. Um, 
And you know, the, 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 the challenge here, I think, for the industry as a whole is, you know, we all recognize that cloud native is a, is a much better way of doing things if you're starting with a clean sheet of paper, but many of us don't have that, that luxury, right? And, and, and telcos are still demanding that level of functionality that they expect um, you know, in order to be able to deploy a network function. So it's gonna take a while before uh, you know, people are um, you know, able to put the time and resources in to essentially recreate some of those network functions in some new form, embodying cloud native uh, ar architecture. Um, that's something we started to do four or five years ago and you know, we're at a point now where we have cloud native stuff, genuinely cloud native stuff that we started with a clean sheet of paper and the cloud as our playground, um, ready to go in, into production. Um, you know, the rest of the industry, um, I guess, you know, has to make their own decisions about when to start investing, how much to invest in this. Um, but you know, there's no question that the cloud native approach will always beat the traditional approach if you, uh, it, as long as the cloud native approach has got kind of parity on, on functionality. Thank you. Also in that wordy bit that we started with at the beginning as I read out, um, there was mention of lightweight container environments and so on. Let's sort of move that sort of area. What are the advantages of containers over hypervisors and how can any risks associated be mitigated? So, uh, I mean, we think of containers as virtualization 2.0 um, and, and hypervisors as virtualization 1.0. If we think about where hypervisors came from, they came from the IT world where people had a whole mix of different kinds of software in their, their IT department, some of it running on Windows, Solaris, different flavors of Unix, Linux, you know, and if you wanted to consolidate that all on one machine, then because they're all running different operating systems, what you had to do was emulate a physical server, and that's what a hypervisor does. Mm. But these days, if you're writing software from scratch for a new application, you only ever use Linux. So, um, you know, why do you need this, this stack that emulates a physical server um, when there are much better ways of, I mean, essentially what you're trying to do here is deploy multiple workloads on a physical server that are securely partitioned from one another where you know they can share the resources, but in a secure way, and we can we can uh, assign resources to workloads, you know, according to what they need. That's what containers do, and this is a technology that's actually been around in the Linux space for, for quite some time. Um, very much brought to prominence by Docker, who invented a, a, a packaging format that makes it really easy to take advantage of this built-in capability of Linux, um, and. The web scale world has adopted containers, uh, you know, incredibly rapidly. Um, and you know, if, if you're building a new web scale app, you're almost invariably going to use containers uh, to do it because it's it's a it's a cleaner, easier, lighter weight way of, of packaging. There's a lot less overhead. Um, it's it's extremely portable. You know, you can run it. It makes it very easy to run an application on a hybrid cloud, which means you know a mix of, of public and private cloud. Uh, these things spin up very quickly, so you can make a very responsive kind of system. You know, you can create capacity on demand. There there are all sorts of advantages to to, to doing this, and and really very little downside. Now, the downside, people sometimes say, you know what, these things are not quite as secure as virtual machines. And, I, and I, I wouldn't want to get into a deep argument with a security expert on that topic. Actually, the way people generally deploy containers is inside virtual machines. And so essentially what you say is, okay, I'll, I'll create a virtual machine which is, you know, provides a secure space for that application. And then I'll deploy a bunch of containers inside that which have got the different components of my microservice-based cloud-native uh, application. Uh, and and that, so that overcomes the, the security issue. And then there's some, still some issues around the flexibility of networking in containers, which are being worked in the open source communities right now, and, and, and we're contributing to that. Um, and, and once that's sorted out, I think you know, there's, there's no question containers will be ready for prime time in the NFV space. Moving on, you mentioned again, another word mentioned, it was microservices and microservice based solutions and so on. So let's just go a bit more deeply into that. How will the adoption of microservices-based solutions change the way that the services themselves are being deployed or will be deployed? Well, I, I think there's a belief that uh, once you've decomposed a service into a bunch of, of, of very kind of atomic building blocks that do useful things like, you know, store subscriber profiles or manipulate SIP messages or, you know, the sort of fundamental building blocks of, of services, then you can rearrange them in, in, in new and novel ways. Um, and, and you can also um, deploy them f as point solutions where um, you know, a traditional network function would be, would be overkill. Um, 
so uh, session border controller is, is, a, is a great case in point. Um, SBC, you know, it's a very complex piece of equipment, does all sorts of different things in it. Uh, and people sometimes deploy them just to do one little job, which is to mo manipulate SIP messages because of some interop issue between different components of their network. Okay, so it's a really a, a sledgehammer to crack a nut. And if you have a microservice that can do the SIP message manipulation, you might use it as part of an overall SBC solution. But if that's all you want to do, then that's all you need to deploy. Um, you know, so l l less resources, far less complexity, because instead of having to configure this massively complex SPC just to do this little tiny job, you've got this very simple little building block that you can configure, and so much easier to manage and deploy. Thank you. Final question. When you, we've mentioned public hybrid clouds, public and private clouds. How can network operators leverage public cloud resources in their future service deployments? Will they, and if so, how can they do it? Well, they certainly can. Um, and uh, I mean, we, we, we've shown a, a very uh, convincing demo of a hybrid cloud environment where we've got a, uh, this is a, a fully containerized Vaulty stack uh, running on private cloud, but with a geo redundancy backup in running in, in the public cloud. And uh, we, we can run with very limited resources in the public cloud, just sort of maintaining a kind of background level of processing so that we've got the information necessary to take over if the main site fails. Main site fails, and then we very rapidly spin up these containers to handle the call processing in the public cloud. Um, and we get, you know, failover within, within a minute or two of all the calls, you know, even in, on a heavily loaded system. Uh, and the cost of operating that geo redundant site is a tiny fraction of what it would cost you to go out and build a physical facility to do that, uh, which would be you know, totally underutilized 98% of the time. Um, so I think that's, that, that's a very good use case um, around you know, using public cloud as a, um, you know, as a contingency, if you like. But I think that public cloud potentially has a much bigger role to play. Um, I mean, I, I think it's clear to many network operators that um, you know, th one of the big challenges of NFV is building and operating that private cloud environment that's going to host their, their, their VNFs. And it's consuming a huge amount of resource. They're on massive learning curves. Um, and, uh, you know, some of them, frankly, are, are struggling with it. Um, now, you know, the public cloud operators are incredibly good at that. They've been at it a long time. Um, they've got incredible economies of scale. Um, you know, they buy the hardware extremely cheaply. Um, they've, th th their ratio of, of, of technicians to uh, equipment is you know, orders of magnitude lower than, uh, the, 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 than a, a, a typical telco. So the running costs are incredibly low. Um, so I, I mean, I really think that telcos should very seriously consider engaging with, with, with public cloud operators. I mean, at, at the moment, there tends to be a no way we could never possibly do that because they think of the public cloud as a place where, you know, hackers and developers sort of do yeah, their app thing, you know, insecure, right, and it's not unsafe. telco grade mm. and, 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 and not fine. And, and also they, you know, sometimes you get the attitude, look, we, we build and operate networks. That's what we do for a living. Right. So why would we rely on somebody else to do that, to do that for us? Well, the answer might be because actually they might be better at that aspect of building the network. What you're really good at is the service and uh, and, and the marketing of it and the billing of it and the customer relationships and, and all that. Mm. If that's now purely in software, for goodness sake, why do you feel the need to own and operate all, all this hardware? So the second set of objections then is, oh, what is security and quality of service and SLAs and, uh, and regulatory and those kinds of things. Well, okay, but don't assume that just because those problems may be apparent from the sort of standard public cloud offerings. Don't assume that those problems are insoluble. Um, you know, this is a big enough opportunity for the public cloud operators to be prepared to create something, especially for the telcos. You know, a telco platform as a service, um, and, and so that's the sort of conversation I think um, you know we'd like to see happen, and, and you know we'd like to see ourselves being in the middle of it, of course. Very, very clear exposition. I'm not surprised. <laughs> Martin Taylor, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.